wasn't so nervous before, and I'm nervous. Um, I'd like to start by, well, thank you, Andrea. I'd thank, like to thank uh, Rich Matsuda uh, for instigating this because it, he's been asking for a, a presentation on this for over a year. And this finally made it happen. So thanks to the tech science meeting organizers as well. So in terms of a bit of personal background, I joined CAC in 1991. Jerry Smith hired me um, based on my past experience at observatories in Chile and Hawaii and Arizona, and also having a PhD in polishing and testing large optics. And my first role at CAC Observatory was as CAC's optics engineer, and I was responsible for putting all the optics in the CAC-1 telescope, aligning those optics, procuring all the CAC-2 optics, getting all the primary mirror segments uh, iron figured. But uh, before I came to CAC, I'd also been working at Stewart Observatory with Roger Angel and started the uh, adaptive optics program there. So I was also well positioned for uh, working on adaptive optics at CAC. On the time frame when we, was, when we were starting adaptive optics at CAC, as Andrea mentioned, uh, the US military after the fall of Berlin Wall, uh, Bob Fugate was starting to uh, tell us about what the military had been doing. Um, also, there have been a number of ex experimental demonstrations of adaptive optics for astronomy, but the, there was only one system that just in mid-1993 started doing uh, science as a community resource uh, AO system. That was a 52 actuator um, come on plus system on the ESO 3.6 meter. So, okay, so the way I've organized this presentation is a few different categories here. Um, and I'll get to acknowledgements at the end, but I also want to acknowledge that from the start that Keck Adaptive Optics is the work of many hands, many minds, many hearts, and it's been a, a real pleasure working within that community. So to start, the first 10 years. Um, so we start with a proposal from uh, what was largely written by Ed Stone from the Caltech president to the Keck Foundation, asking for $5 million of the CAC-2 development fund because we were underspent, and then a, a 1.2 million from NASA as their one six share. Uh, so we actually got that funding in December, 1993. So we had a pretty impressive science team to work with. Uh, people like Jerry Nelson, Gary Chan, and Terry Mass that had been working on the telescope optics with, as well as uh, scientists from Caltech and, and UC. Uh, Claire Max had started an AO program based on the sodium laser guide star approach that she and Hopper had developed that, um, as part of the Jason project. And so she'd started a program at Lawrence Livermore on that. Um, the first thing we worked on together as a team was producing the Blue Book, about a 400 page report. And the main products from that were um, understanding the requirements on the facility we wanted to build, uh, the system architecture and subsystem definitions, and, and the narrow budget for that system. These are the this is, these are the subsystems we came up with. And, and then we spent a, a bit of time uh, in sort of a competitive proposal process where we had an external advisory committee that was actually consisted of um, Bob Fugate, uh, who had was the person at Air Force, Starfire, who had released a lot of the, the information about what the Air Force was doing. Um, Dave Sandler from Thermotrax, they did things like build AO systems for the Navy for horizontal path adaptive optics. And Chris Shelton, who uh, had, was in the process of building an AO system, an astronomical system for the 100 inch on Mount Wilson. As a result of that overall process, we came up with this uh, division of labor. So uh, Claire's at group at, at Livermore uh, provided the laser subsystems and also the wavefront controller system. Um, Keck provided the rest of the hardware as well as the project management, and we were responsible for the system INT. Um, this is a picture of the Keck 2 uh, AO system or the enclosure on the Keck 2 uh, telescope. Inside that uh, um, enclosure, there's the AO bench with per scale is about eight feet on one side. Our, the first science instrument to be uh, built with or AO at Keck was NERC 2, built by Keith Matthews and Tom Slifer as an AO imager. Um, and it came online in about 2002, so it was a little behind the AO system. So Ian McLean had, of course, built nurse back. It was designed as a seeing limited image, a seeing limited instrument. And I designed some re-imaging optics for it so we could use it behind adaptive optics as well. 
Um, this is uh, this is how we spent our Christmas in 1998, putting the first system on the two telescope. So we're just in the process of putting all the hard work here. Since we didn't have a science camera yet, uh, James Larkin provided KCAM and engineering infrared camera from UCLA, and we used that for the first year or two. Um, and then on the night of February 4th, 1999, um, first time we tried to close the loop, it worked. And, uh, but it wasn't until uh, about three in the morning because we were still dealing with uh, cabling issues. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some real key people here, Scott Acton, um, had a previous adaptive expertise from uh, working at Lockheed. Uh, he led a lot of our AO and, and optics work. Paul Stonsky led a lot of our software efforts, along with William Lupton. Um, Olivier Lai was our first uh, um, AO postdoc. Devin Ho led the um, electronics. And uh, Chris Shelton, who was one of our reviewers, decided to join us as part of the CAP team. So uh, meanwhile, down at headquarters, we're building up the second AO system um, for the Keck-1 telescope. And this was prompted by the NASA interferometer. So we needed identical NGS systems on both telescopes. And then um, basically in December 2000, we're at it again. And um, some new team members here. So this was first light for that. <laughs> I've had Hawaiian shirts for a long time. A new key player was David Lemignon, who was a AO postdoc at that point, but he became an AO scientist at CAC, and he led a lot of our activities. Uh, John Gaffray uh, helped with the software, and he actually was very important for the CAC interferometer effort. And then a few months after this first light, we had first fringes with the CAC interferometer using the AO systems above telescopes. And the real um, brains and uh, leadership on this project was from Mark Folvita. From JPL, he led the JPL team. Uh, Rachel Aitkinson led the uh, science side of things from Caltech IPAC, and I led the tech side of the uh, tech interferometer. Yes, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> we all had a little more hair then. <laughs> um, in terms of lasers on Mauna Kea, before we could project them from Mauna Kea, we needed to figure out uh, what the policies would be. So I led a group uh, organized by the directors including uh, people from uh, uh, Gemini, Subaru, CFHT, and UH. And we came up with policies for Mauna Kea, things like laser traffic control systems, um, satellite avoidance, uh, aircraft avoidance as well. And then um, by 2003, we had our uh, first flight for the LGSAO system. This took a while. Well, well, you'll see why when I show you the laser system later on. Um, some new key players here. Uh, at this point, I think Marcos was a postdoc. He was a joint postdoc, a CFAO funded one, working with uh, Bruce McIntosh and, and W.E. Um, another postdoc was Antonin Boucher, who's now our new head of adaptive optics. Uh, Eric Johansson was key, uh, and he was from Livermore originally, but came to CAC and, and getting away from controller finalized. Um, one of the key people at CAC for adaptive optics has been Jason Chin. Um, in terms of the engineering, getting things done, and especially on our three or four uh, laser guide star facilities. So we couldn't have done it without that either. So we completed the startup. Next phase was the upgrade path. And that's what we've been on for the last 20 years or so. <laughs> so that included multiple new lasers and laser guide star facilities, a couple of rounds of real-time controllers and, and new wavefront sensor cameras, and um, also near infrared uh, wavefront sensing to take advantage of, you know, a lot of objects are red and you've got partial correction at those wavelengths. And, you know, the whole point of all these upgrades was to keep the system scientifically competitive for you folks in the community. And so this was why the laser was a hard thing to get going. Um, it consisted of six YAG lasers here in enclosure on the dome floor, as well as a, uh, a Dimaster oscillator. And then up on the side of the telescope, there's two stages of diamplification before we project it up through a side launch uh, system. So we spent a lot of time at Livermore getting this system working, a very much experimental system from the Lawrence Livermore Avalis program. And then... Um, and then 15. Oh, 15. then 15. 
Um, and uh, so we spent a, a good deal of time with this system in the lab at, in Waimea as well. And then uh, a, another group of uh, laser physicists from Livermore helped us getting it operational at the uh, at the telescope. So we wanted, we didn't want to repeat that for Chuck one. So we went uh, with a different approach in a collaboration with Gemini, and that's going with Lockheed Martin coherent technology on a some frequency um, solid state laser. And in this case, a much smaller, oops, much quite a bit smaller system, um, although that's still a nine foot bench, and in an enclosure here on the side of the telescope. And then we went for center launch here to reduce the perspective elongation of, of the LGS. Um, both the previous laser and this laser still required, you know, real laser expertise. And so a lot of hand holding and preparation for every observing night. Um, so we went a different approach for round three. And that was uh, a collaboration that Norbert Duban at the ESA and I got started, where we went to industry and basically had five rounds of, or sorry, a, a round of bidders, about five companies, down selected to two. And then we, um, Went, took two through a preliminary design and then selected Toptica and MPB to build a laser system. And this was also, by the way, supported by GMT and TMP. And this is the new standard in the community, right? So where we had 40 to 50 kilowatts out of the wall for the first laser, we got more like one and a half kilowatts for this laser, where the first laser got 14 watts on the sky. This has 20 watts on the sky, but it's the coupling efficiency of the sodium because of how much we learned about sodium in the process is about 20 times higher. So, and again, we're center launching on, on CAC-2. And then uh, this is laser facility four, where we, um, this is part of the copper project, where we also put a, um, a tactical laser on CAC-1. Uh, and some more key players here, uh, our engineering team, Sylvain Sepp, um, who uh, has led our real-time and, and software efforts. Uh, Sam Raglan, who's been a key senior AO scientist for us. Um, Scott um, Lilly, who do has done the optomechanical mechanical work, and Ed Weatherall on electronics. And Jim Like, of course, has been the operations lead. He's helped a lot. I should have mentioned earlier for Tech 2 LGS that Randy Campbell was pretty key to our getting the system operational as well. So we've worked well with the, well, Operations may not feel it sometimes, but I think we've worked well with operations. Um, yeah. And then, you know, this is the near infrared tip tilt sensor. This was a collaboration with uh, Caltech. Uh, so Roger Smith and, and, and Rich Tacanian company here built the trick doer, uh, basically reading out a small region of interest on an H2RG engineering grade detector and um, basically doing tip tilt production on that. Um, and you can see the improvement between uh, strap, which is our visible tip tilt sensor, and trip, which is the infrared one. OSIRIS, I hadn't mentioned before, but that was built by James Larkin and company at UCLA. And we originally had that on Keck 2 at the at the visitor port, if you like, where NERSPEC goes. But then when we brought the laser guide star system over here, we also moved OSIRIS to this telescope. Um, again, another uh, first light. We've had a lot of those. Uh, you know, we've been drinking a lot of champagne. <laughs> uh, a couple of new players here. Uh, Charlotte Bond, who was an AO postdoc, who led the, the pyramid wavefront sensor efforts. And uh, Jacques Delorme, who was actually a Caltech postdoc that ended up moving to Hawaii to help with the integration of, of KPEC and uh, stayed around as a Keck AO scientist. You can actually see Nam and Dimitri in the background here. They were participating in that night. And then here's a, a image that Juan Do provided me with um, showing our normal LGSA uh, performance on the galactic center and then with the near infrared pyramid wave from sensor. So unfortunately we had to decommission the first one. It was a demonstrator. We couldn't make a facility class, but we're hoping to get back to this. And we'll talk about that a little later. Um, there's been some missed opportunities in my mind. Um, one was the decommissioning of the interferometer. <laughs> we uh, actually, well, NASA achieved its key science with the measurements of zodiacal dust, and that was a nice program. But when we didn't have the outrigger telescopes, it was kind of the death knell for the interferometer. I kept it going for a few more years by putting in an NSF MRI proposal um, to add uh, allow us to do fainter stars, do astrometry with the interferometer, um, <clears throat> which we started to do. Now, of course, VLT has got the 
you know, they're the, the big game with gravity. Um, but it, nobody wanted to pay for the operation cost of it. So it got decommissioned in 2012. I shed a few tears over that. Um, you think AOS hard? Interferometry is another level. <laughs> um, and so also, we, you know, decommissioning the pyramid wafering sensor demonstrator we had, but we hope to get back to that. We had a big effort uh, that culminated in a, a, PD, a successful PDR in uh, 2010, this effort for a next generation AO system. This effort was led by myself at CAC and uh, uh, Rich Takaney here at Caltech and Don Gable and Sarah Max at Santa Cruz. And we basically came up with a system that could have been doing visible kind of science within adaptive optics uh, now, right? But again, money. So um, we had to go back to the upgrade path. And by the way, this is a nice picture of the interferometer in the basin, basement. Now it's just got a single, what, KPF instrument in it? <laughs> <laughs> and soon I. So we're continue, con currently continuing on the upgrade path over the next few years. Um, and we've been judging what we're going to work on basically based on our LGS AO error budget. These are the largest terms in that error budget. So we, we implement the new real-time controllers to improve the bandwidth error and also with the cameras, the measurement error. And also provide a base on which we could um, build up things like COP and HACA. Right? Because the, the processing power of the old system wasn't enough. Um, COPPA is designed to reduce the post line isoplanetism error, which is the largest error term in, in the LGS budget by doing laser tomography. Um, we, we're working on HACA now, which is a high order deformable mirror, and that's designed to reduce the largest error term in the NGS AO error budget. We've also been working on some, a number of advanced wafer control techniques to try to improve, especially the performance for high contrast science. So COPPA um, actually has four um, science legacy programs that, that drive it, one led by Andrea and her Galactic Center group, another one led by uh, Shelley Wright, and um, one led by um, Mike Liu and uh, Dimitri Mawe, and the fourth one um, by Tomasa Treu on dark energy and dark matter. And then our project scientist is Jessica Liu, and she's been leading that group and preparing for observations with COPPA. And so currently we have, as you saw before, the lasers in place. We've got an astrosome generator here that projects four laser beacons. And we're trying to deal with focal and isoplanetism here. The fact that this is 90 kilometers is not infinity. So you're not sampling the full cylinder of turbulence. And so we're projecting four laser beacons to do that. Uh, we've implemented the new real-time controller already. We've also got the pupil relay optics to, to and with the wavefront sensor camera to allow us to have four pupils or measuring the, the four um, LGS. And we've also put a lot of um, new tools in place here so we can try um, tomography in the daytime, basically, by having a phase screen that moves uh, across the field and to different altitudes, that kind of thing. And we're also making improvements to trick to make it more reliable. This is, as James was saying earlier, this is where we hope to put LIGER. And HACA is, the project here is to replace, um, the, and this is mostly driven by high contrast science, Becky Jensen Clems, our project scientist. And so replacing the deferral mirror, the 349 actuator Cynatics DM with a 2844 actuator deferral mirror. And also a new waveform sensor. And uh, we've, in this case, you know, because we're finding how hard it is to do development on the systems at the summit, we put together a whole lab system here, which is basically a duplicate of the summit system where we'll put the deferral mirror here. We can test it with an interferometer. We'll have the, the wavefront sensor camera for HACA. Oops, run away. Um, for uh, HACA here as well, and we'll have our spare real-time controller. So we'll do closed loop testing before we ever go to the, the summit. And uh, it, uh, Steph and um, Becky with support from people like Ashley here, here. Uh, have been doing these simulations to try to understand the contrast performance with HACA and also with EVA, which is the next pyramid wavefront sensor in the infrared that we hope to build. This is the, the pyramid system where we have high order modes to match the HACA deformal mirror, also low order mode for, for fainter stars or for LGS um, uh, support and Zernike wavefront sensor and improved performance. 
uh, contrast with this system. And Steph is the, is the project scientist for, for EVA. And then uh, I mentioned the advanced wave control techniques that we've been working on. Uh, this is one um, that uh, Malama actually, uh, sorry, Misa Salama recently published. And that's demonstrating that with the Zernike wavefront sensor, which is in KPEC, that we can actually improve the phasing of the primary mirror and get uh, higher straddles basically as a result of that. So we're, we're, we have a term in our budget that's about 130 nanometers. We think most of that is actually due to primary mirror phasing errors. You know, we're, when we phase with the PCS, we're doing a different job than we're phasing with the whole primary mirror segment. So uh, we're hoping to make this an operational tool longer term. Um, uh, Charlotte Guthrie, another one of our, our postdocs, AF postdocs at CAC, uh, has been working with Mike Bottom. He, Mike actually talked about this yesterday, fast and furious local plane technique, and just showing the kinds of improvements we can get with it. We hope to have that as an operational tool for imaging with NERC 2 fairly soon. And there's also been work on predictive wave control that Becky's been leading, and we're implementing with the, the HACA system as well, and, uh, and speckle knowing. Mike, we've been working with Mike on. Um, we've been collaborating with NASA Goddard on the idea of an artificial star on a satellite and we're very highly elliptical orbit. So it's got an orbit of, of 200,000 kilometers here. And so when it's um, at certain points in its orbit, it'll be moving very slowly with respect to the background. And so you can keep it within seven arc seconds or so of that science target for periods of a half hour to a few hours. And so we, we see that as being a very powerful natural guide star system. Um, we've done some risk reductions. In particular, we put together a visible camera called ORCID on CAP2, and we've demonstrated 15 milliarc second images. Um, so it's just taking fast exposures, but just shift and adding them after the fact. So 15 milliarc seconds in the visible. We just want to get higher straps, which we hope to do with HACA, for example. And we another risk reduction we've done is we um, got the laser communication relay demonstrated, which is a geostationary satellite to point its laser at us. And with our infrared pyramid wavefront sensor, that's open loop and then closed loop. And that was very stable, right? So we can actually close on, on these sources. We've also done it on asteroids. Um, so science, of course, that's been the motivation and inspiration for everything we're doing with adaptive optics. Uh, you've heard a lot about the instruments already. So on Tech one um, we've had Osiris. We hope to have Liger, as James was describing to you. Tech 2 we've had NERF2, NERSPEC, KPEC, and more recently, ORCID, the visible camera. And then with Bach and Eva, we hope to be supporting the science with uh, scales that Andy spoke about and high spec that uh, Mike spoke about. Um, one of our key metrics is just science publications. You know, this is very gratifying to see the science that comes out of these systems. This is a plot of the number of refereed science publications cumulatively over the years. Oops. And the total is 1,269 papers with uh, 492 using laser guide star through 2023. The plot on the right is actually rough read science papers again, but from all laser guide star facilities worldwide. And so in the late 90s, the system that Bob Fugate built at Starfire was actually open to some astronomers and they, it was a Rayleigh guide star system and they got a few science papers out of it. But it wasn't until we uh, got the Keck uh, LGS system operation that LGS science started taking off. And we really dominated here for a long period of time until the VLT. <laughs> <laughs> and um, these are, it's actually mostly brown layer adaptive optics that they're used, doing right now, but they also have a laser tomography mode. And I just lost heart there in 2021 and stopped tracking because I knew they were dominating. Um, another a metric, of course, beyond Nobel prizes is uh, citations. <laughs> And of course, uh, these are the top 10 cited papers. And of course, Andrea and her group are, are in this list here. There's also, of course, HR 799, the imaging that Christian and Bruce, the, that group did. And uh, there's also, you know, I find it really interesting, the physics, right, of, you know, putting constraints on dark energy or, you know, better uh, measurements of H naught that are able to be done, you know, using gravitational lens, quasars and things like that. So it's, it's a rich, uh, amount of science, I think. A lot of it, by the way, in the highly cited is, is LGS. 
I just wanted to show some pretty pictures, more recent from 2023, you know, some geometry of the small Uranian moons. Or, and uh, HR8799, Jason Wong puts together these nice images. And this is actually with KPEC measuring the minimum rotational velocities of the, the four moons of, uh, or, the, or the four planets of HR8799. A uh, nice picture of the Orion bar in H2. Also an LGS observation. I uh, had to show one of the galactic center images. Uh, this one of tidal disruption of the source X7. And uh, I, I love the gravitational lens science too. And, and we get some beautiful images of that. Um, so what's the future? Um, we, we, CAC has produced a, a 2035 strategic plan. These are the goals and the projects that are in that strategic plan. And I'd like to see what roles adaptive optics can play in that. So in terms of high spatial resolution, high you know, diffraction limited kind of adaptive optics, that covers three of the goals of many of the projects. And then enhanced seeing that you would get with ground layer AO covers the other goals and many of the other projects. So I think AO has a bright future uh, at CAP in the future. And uh, finish with acknowledgments. Um, so I think a key part of the elements of, of tech's AO success is this group of folks. So it's the science community, right? That, you know, use the systems, tell us what we need to be doing um, and define basically the requirements for what we do as AO system developers or science instrument developer. We couldn't do it without the funders. And of course the NSF, NASA, um, uh, Tech Foundation, Moore Foundation, Heising Simons, they've all helped us to build these systems. And then um, we we couldn't do it without a lot of great vendors. And we've had some good collaborations with vendors to build the pieces we need, both for the instruments and the AO system. We've had excellent collaboration within the international AO community. We've learned a lot from them. We've had good collaborations uh, and it's been a win-win overall. And then of course, observatory operations is key to supporting the science you folks do. And this all feeds back in the next loop. And uh, it would be a huge list if I tried to put everybody up that had helped in Keck adaptive optics. These are our current um, team at Keck, uh, now led by Anthony Boucher and Eduardo Marine, and uh, our consultants are all former Keck employees, and a lot of great collaborators in this community, and then um, also collaborators at Goddard and, and in industry. So I wanted to finish by saying mahalo and aloha to the Keck science community for the great science that inspires us to do this kind of work.